Hello, I'm going to tell you about witness indistinguishability for any single round argument with applications to access control, and this is joint work with Yale Kalai. I'll start by talking about delegating NP computation. So this is the setting where we have a verifier, which is usually computationally weak, and it wants to learn whether some uh, NP statement X uh, is valid or not, whether X belongs to some NP language L. And it wants to use the computational power of a powerful uh, prover or server which has the witness for this NP language. So the obvious way to do this is for the prover to simply just send the witness to the verifier. But what we want is to do it uh, with uh, fewer resources in terms of communication and computation complexity for the verifier. So what we want is a proof system, which of course needs to have um, completeness and soundness, but also should have succinct communication. So the communication should be much lower than the length of the witness W. And also the complexity of the verifier should be much lower than uh, the complexity of actually running the NP verification on the actual witness. Given these requirements, uh, we can just hope to send uh, a message from the prover to the verifier, uh, but we still want to minimize the interaction or the number of rounds of communication. So what we can hope for is to have a two message protocol where the verifier first sends a query Q and then the prover responds uh, with an answer A. And furthermore, we can hope that the query Q uh, can be generated independently of the particular NP statement X that we want to um, that we want to verify. Another requirement is that the complexity of the prover should also be moderate. So it should uh, be proportional to the complexity of actually verifying uh, the, the NP witness with the, with the statement. So this is, um, in general, the task of delegating NP computation. And we can think of a few variants of this, uh, of this task. For example, the question is whether the verifier needs secret information in order to verify the validity of the answer A. So we can think about pub public verifiability, where everybody who has Q and A can actually run the verification procedure and check whether the verifier would accept or not. Or we can think about secret verifiability, where the verifier while generating the query Q also generates a secret key, which it keeps uh, secret from the prover. And the secret key is used in order to verify uh, the, answer, the answer A. And indeed, in many protocols in the standard model, you actually need this uh, secret verifiability. Uh, another uh, parameter that we want to consider is uh, selective versus adaptive soundness. So the question is whether um, the NP statement uh, the NP statement X can be chosen by the prover uh, after uh, seeing the query Q for soundness purposes, or whether we can assume that uh, the, prov the, uh, the, the NP statement is chosen um, independently of the, of the query Q. Um, and last parameter that we're going to talk about is privacy for the prover. So the prover might want to also maintain the privacy of the witness that it is using. And in this communication pattern, this translates to uh, the notion of witness indistinguishability. So um, the verifier should not be able to tell whether the prover used witness W1 or witness W2 um, for, for proving the uh, validity of the MP state. Uh, in terms of known constructions, so in the random oracle model or under knowledge assumptions, uh, we can really get the best possible parameters and uh, even um, get a single message, uh, get a single message argument system with uh, uh, optimal um, with optimal uh, uh, communication complexity and computation complexity and so on. In the standard model, things are uh, more complicated, and we only have limited results for uh, limited classes, subclasses. Um, of, of NP statements, and uh, in particular, these uh, uh, these protocols uh, require secret verifiability. And what we do in this work is sort of try to enhance the properties of these uh, NP delegation uh, schemes. And in particular, we're going to show how to add witness indistinguishability generically to these types of uh, arguments. So let's talk about our results in a little more detail. So what we show is that it's possible to generically uh, transform every uh, NP delegation scheme of this form into one that also has witness indistinguishability. So we can add privacy for the prover on top of an existing uh, delegation scheme. Um, the cost of this transformation is an additive increase in the communication complexity and the verifier complexity compared to the original delegation scheme that we started from. This additive factor is a polynomial in the computational complexity of the original verifier. 
So uh, our new communication complexity and our new verifier complexity are going to be additively larger with a factor that's polynomial in the um, verifier complexity. However, if we start from a very good delegation scheme where the verifier complexity is much smaller uh, than the length of the witness, then this property is going to be maintained even after this uh, additional transformation. In terms of assumptions, uh, we require uh, a super polynomially secure two message uh, malicious maliciously secure oblivious transfer. Uh, and in addition, we require that the original delegation scheme that we start from is also super polynomially um, is also super polynomially sound. And we're going to see where this comes in when we talk a little more about the details of our transformation. Um, in, in the other result in this work is an application. So we present a new primitive that we call an access control scheme. And I'm going to say more about what this primitive is later on. Um, but if, you're, if you know the notion of anonymous credentials, then uh, access control schemes are similar to anonymous credentials. Uh, and they also offer succinctness for the, for the credentials, which is uh, a sought after property in this context. However, they do not have anonymity against the issuer of the credentials. But I will say more about what these access control schemes are later on. Um, in order to construct these access control schemes, we have our witness indistinguishability transformation. We want to apply it on top of one of those uh, NP delegation schemes in the standard model uh, that we uh, that I mentioned in the previous in the previous slide. And for this purpose, we also need super polynomially secure single server private information retrieval scheme, because this would allow us to instantiate uh, those um, uh, NP delegation schemes for uh, limited uh, limited classes of NP statements. And this would give us uh, the, the access control scheme that we need. So concretely, if you sort of take all of these required building blocks and, and sort of go down to the concrete assumptions that are needed, then uh, our results can be instantiated based on the existence, uh, based on the hardness, uh, the super polynomial hardness of assumptions such as learning with errors, um, decisional Diffie-Hellman, decisional composite residuosity, or quadratic residuosity. So these are the results. And what I'm going to do is start by talking about our generic witness indistinguishability transformation. So what we want is to start from a delegation scheme and add witness indistinguishability on top of it. So in the uh, original delegation scheme, it is possible that some information about the witness leaks to the verifier through the response A that the prover needs to compute. And we want to prevent that. And the basic idea is rather than sending A in the clear, what we're going to do is send a commitment to A and a proof that the committed value is uh, sort of proper, is really a value that satisfies uh, the the verification the verification procedure and of course this proof needs to be a witness indistinguishability proof. What do we win by by this? Now the witness indistinguishability proof only um, needs to apply to a statement that has a short witness because it's it's a statement about the value inside the commitment and not a statement about the original uh, the original NP statement. And therefore, uh, even if we start with a witness indistinguishability proof that is not succinct, uh, the eventual communication complexity is going to be succinct. So let's do this in a little more detail. So instead of sending A, we're going to send a commitment to A using some randomness row and an additional proof. And what is this proof? So this is a witness indistinguishability proof that um, C is indeed a valid commitment uh, to a value A. And this value A satisfies uh, the verifier's uh, uh, predicate um, with the uh, with the given query with the given query Q. So we want a witness indistinguishable proof witness indistinguishable proof of this statement. And this is of course a very simple and straightforward idea. And it indeed can be made uh, can be made to work. All we have to do is sort of take care of the subtleties that arise when you actually try to uh, try to apply this uh, uh, this this outline this blueprint. Um, so in terms of soundness, right, in order to be able to prove soundness, what we need is to show that if we have a prover that succeeds in this uh, new uh, transformed protocol, then we also have a prover that succeeds in the original protocol. And the way to do it is to try to sort of take the commitment and pull out the value A, and this is the value A that will allow a prover to succeed in the original protocol. So what we need is to be able to extract the value A out of the, out of the commitment. However, uh, we don't have additional rounds in order to perform extractability. Um, so we're going to use complexity leveraging. In particular, we're going to use a commitment scheme, which is sort of fairly weak. It's super polynomially hard to break, but it can be broken 
uh, with some uh, super polynomial com uh, computational complexity. And we're going to sort of use brute force in order to break the commitment and extract the value A and use it uh, for the purposes of the reduction. And this is the reason why we actually need super polynomial soundness uh, for the original delegation protocol and for the witness indistinguishable proof, because these need to remain sound even in a setting where we can brute force open the commitment. So this is where the super polynomial assumptions come from. So this is in terms of soundness. Other complications that we need to resolve is, first of all, as I said, in many cases, in particular in the cases that we want to use for our application, the protocol is only secretly verifiable. This means that um, the verifier has some secret key that it uses in order to check, the, check whether the um, response A uh, is valid or not. And if the prover wants to come up with a proof uh, that the verifier would indeed accept, then they cannot do it because they don't have the secret key and they must not have the secret key, otherwise soundness is broken. So we need to handle this difficulty. The additional difficulty that we need to handle is that if we just use standard witness indistinguishability, uh, witness indistinguishable proof here, um, then we're going to run into trouble because if you look at the statement that we're that we are that we are proving here, it really only has one witness. The value A, since the, our commitment needs to be uh, statistically or perfectly binding for the purposes of brute force extraction, um, it must be the case that there's only a single witness uh, that uh, um, that that the prover actually uses for the for the setting of this uh, witness indistinguishable proof, and therefore witness indistinguishability is actually meaningless. So we'll need to figure out what to do in order to get a meaningful notion of witness indistinguishability even in this setting. Let's start with handling secret verifiability. So now the verifier also has a secret key that it uses in order to uh, in order to verify the um, in order to verify uh, the the response A, and the idea is to use fully homomorphic encryption. So um, I want to sort of allow the prover to prove a statement that relates to the secret key, but I don't want to give him the secret key in the clear. So what I'm going to do is send a secret, send a homomorphic encryption uh, of this uh, secret verifiability key uh, to the prover. So I'm going to send the query and the public key for the homomorphic encryption scheme and some C0, which is an encryption of, the, um, of this uh, verifier, verifier key. Now the prover can evaluate under the encryption uh, the, the verifier's uh, predicate, um, and it can obtain the, an encryption of what the verifier would have output uh, given the value A that the, that the, prover, that the prover generates. Uh, so let's call this uh, um, encryption uh, CT. So this is, an, this is supposed to be an encryption of one if indeed the response A is a valid response for the um, for the delegation protocol, because the verifier is supposed to accept the prover's response. Now, um, what the prover is going to send back is it's going to send this ciphertext, which is supposed to be an encryption of one. And in addition, it's going to send a proof that the ciphertext was indeed uh, generated properly, so that it was so that it was generated by performing the homomorphic evaluation um, on the uh, FA, on the FHE encryption of the secret uh, of the secret verification key with a response A that is committed to in the commitment C. So this is now going to be the statement that is going to be proven uh, in, in uh, WI. Um, and the verifier can now check that this ciphertext can check, uh, first, first of all, the validity of the uh, WI of the WI proof. In addition, it can check that indeed the ciphertext CT decrypts to one which sort of guarantees that uh, the ciphertext CT is indeed a homomorphic evaluation of some response that is committed to, and uh, this, uh, this response actually leads to, uh, would have led to the verifier actually accepting. Um, and this is uh, sort of our strategy to deal with the secret verifiability issue, but we notice that what we need is a homomorphic encryption with a circuit privacy property, because we wouldn't want information about W or about A to leak from the ciphertext CT. So we need the circuit privacy property, which means that the output ciphertext does not leak information about the computation that was being performed. And furthermore, we need malicious circuit privacy because the parameters of the homomorphic encryption are actually generated by the verifier, which we want to protect against. Indeed, we can get malicious circuit private uh, fully homomorphic encryption under fairly mild variants of the learning with errors problem. So this is one way to resolve this issue, uh, but we can observe that actually 
we need less than fully homomorphic encryption for this task. In fact, the compactness property of the fully homomorphic encryption may not be necessary in this setting. Compactness means that uh, in our case, that the length of the ciphertext CT is independent of the um, size of the circuit for which we did homomorphic evaluation. But in our case, the homomorphic evaluation is of the original verifier. So this com the complexity of the original verifier is um, actually bounded and it actually uh, it's actually possible that other parameters in the uh, in the scheme also um, are also at least as large as this uh, as this complexity. So even if we don't uh, even if we don't have um, compactness for our fully homomorphic encryption scheme, we get the same guarantee about the length of the of the provers uh, of the provers response in the worst case. So. Uh, we can actually rely on a variant on something similar to fully homomorphic encryption without uh, compactness, but with malicious circuit privacy. And this can be constructed using garbled circuits and a maliciously secure uh, oblivious transfer. And this we can do under um, additional assumptions. So uh, in addition to learning with errors, we can also do it under DDH, uh, decisional composite residuosity and quadratic residuosity. So this finishes the um, part about the secret verifiable. Now let's talk about the witness and distinguishable proof system that we need. So um, first of all, let's notice that we want the witness and distinguishable proof to have adaptive soundness. Remember that we talked about adaptive soundness. And I should emphasize that the original delegation scheme that we start from does not need to be adaptively sound. And furthermore, the delegation scheme that we end up with, the one that has witness and distinguishability, uh, is also not going to be adaptively sound. And nevertheless, we need uh, to require that the witness and distinguishable uh, proof system that we use inside our construction does have adaptive soundness. And the reason is that the statement that is proven using this WI proof system is only determined after uh, the uh, prover has seen the first message, uh, the first message of the verifier. So in fact, the statement is chosen um, sort of adaptively after the parameters for the witness and distinguishable proof uh, have been uh, have been selected, and therefore we need adaptive we need adaptive soundness. Um, so this is one requirement that that we need. the The other requirement is with respect to the um, variant of uh, witness indistinguishability uh, that is required, and this is what uh, I mentioned uh, um, when when we talked about the obstacles. So um, just plain witness indistinguishability is not going to be good enough. What we need is this notion of strong witness indistinguishability, which talks, which talks about witness indistinguishability between distributions of instances and witnesses. So in strong witness indistinguishability, we consider two different distributions of pairs of instance witness. And what we say is that if the distributions of the instances are computationally indistinguishable, then it should also hold that if we generate proofs with respect to these uh, with respect to these instances, then the proofs themselves are also going to be indistinguishable. So you don't just hide um, which witness you use for a specific instance; you also hide which instance you're using um, when when the instances come from uh, from two uh, computationally indistinguishable distributions. And indeed, it's going to be the case that in, in our setting, if the prover starts from two different witnesses for the original NP statement, W1 and W2, this is going to translate to two different distributions on instances, which are computationally, uh, which are computationally indistinguishable. And um, therefore, this notion of strong uh, witness indistinguishability is actually going to provide the, the type of uh, witness indistinguishability that we need in order to argue that the final um, uh, the final the, uh, witness indistinguishable delegation scheme that we have does have sort of the standard notion of witness indistinguishability with respect to witnesses for the original NP statement. Um, and in order to uh, in order to actually instantiate this uh, this component, uh, we use the works of uh, Jane Kalai Kurana and Rothblum or uh, Kalai Kurana and Sahai, and they construct strong witness indistinguishability for NP under supernormally secure malicious oblivious transfer. Uh, which exists under learning with errors, uh, DDH, dis uh, decisional composite residuosity, or QR. So all these assumptions that we that we actually could rely on. Um, so this concludes our witness indistinguishability transformation, and let me briefly talk about our access control scheme. So let's see what is access control. So we consider a space of attributes. So it could be a very large space. Uh, let's just we're just going to number the attributes with numbers between one and capital N. 
And what we want is for an author to allow an authority to assign credentials to a user, which corresponds to a subset of the, uh, of the attributes. So um, each user has a subset, uh, owns a subset of these attributes. And we have an authority which has a master secret key. And of course, there's a master public key that everyone um, has access to. And using the master secret key, it can give credentials to a user, to a user which sort of prove that the user has uh, indeed uh, uh, owns, these, uh, owns these credentials. And once the user uh, owns these attributes, sorry, once the user has these credentials, then any entity can efficiently sort of challenge uh, the user and check um, it, that the user actually has attributes that satisfy some monotone relation F. So the monotonicity here is because, well, you know, if you have uh, a subset of the attributes, then of course you also have some smaller subset uh, of, of the same attribute. So we only need to uh, uh, deal with uh, monotone, monotone relations here. And this uh, procedure can be done uh, efficiently and uh, succinctly um, as we will see uh, in as we will see in a minute. So we want to be able to uh, allow any entity uh, in the world to issue a query such that uh, and the query contains uh, uh, some monotone relation and the user who has credentials that satisfy this relation are going to is going to be able to show that it indeed um, owns credentials that satisfy the relation, but without revealing any additional information. So as, as I said, we want soundness and, and collusion resistance. Uh, so these are the standard notions for these, uh, for these sort of uh, um, so attribute-based schemes. Um, we want succinctness. So we want, to, we want the uh, query and the proof uh, to, be, uh, to have communication and computational complexity that are much, much smaller than the size of the, than the, size of the relation. So the relation could have like sort of many, uh, many different uh, clauses. It can be, so either you have attribute one or you have one of attributes, uh, you know, two to five, or you have attribute six, or you have attributes uh, 18 and 19 and so on. So it can be a sort of a very long monotone relation, uh, but we want the, uh, the query and the proof to be independent of uh, the complexity of, of computing the relation. Um, and we want anonymity. Uh, uh, in the sense that the, in the sense that the uh, verifier, the person who issues the cues and the, the query and gets the response, cannot tell um, which uh, cannot tell which attributes the user actually has. It only knows that the user has some set of attributes that satisfies the monotone relation. In order to construct this, we use as a building block uh, this notion of batch NP delegation, and let me explain why that is. So. Uh, let's start with the notion of a batch statement. So a batch statement is a collection of sort of small NP statements and in additional an aggregator function that computes, um, that computes uh, a predicate on the validity of each one of these NP statements. So let's uh, sort of look at a drawing. So we have a bunch of these small NP statements, x1, x2, up to xm. And each one of these uh, NP statements, these inputs can either uh, be in a language L or, or can um, not be in a, or can uh, not belong to the language L. And on top of this, uh, and on top of these sort of predicates, so each one of these predicates you can just think about as a bit. So it's one if X is in the language and zero if X is not in the language. And there's a function F that is applied to this collection of bits. And this constitutes uh, sort of the, the total batch statement. So there's a bunch of uh, small NP statements. And on top of those, you compute some, uh, you compute some relation. Um, and the, these uh, works uh, that I mentioned uh, um, actually allow to uh, actually allow to um, provide succinct delegation schemes for batch NP statements, uh, where the verifier complexity and the communication complexity only scale with the length of the small NP witness and not with the length. So in order to give a witness for this entire big batch statement, you actually need to give a bunch of witnesses, one for each one of these, um, of these uh, small NP instances. However, it's possible to show that you can do, you can get, actually get delegation schemes where uh, the communication complexity only scales with the length of a single uh, witness for these, for these small statements. And this is what we're going to use in our, uh, in our construction of the access control scheme. So um, our master secret key and master public key are just going to correspond to a standard signature scheme. So there's going to be a verification key for a signature scheme used as master public key and a signing key used as a secret key. 
And in order to assign the credentials, you simply are, you're simply going to assign the attributes that belong to the user together with a tag uh, that corresponds to the identity of the specific user. So this is how you assign the credentials. Now, in order to successfully, to succinctly prove uh, that you own credential satisfying uh, the, the relation F, you're just going to use a batch delegation protocol. So you're going to use these batch delegation schemes uh, that, that, we, that we just described. And indeed you can have uh, batch delegation schemes uh, where the aggregator function is a monotone formula. Um, and um, you're going to be able to provide a proof uh, to issue queries and then uh, provide 16 proofs uh, for uh, sort of the validity for owning credentials that satisfy this uh, that satisfy this uh, uh, batch NP relation, and the succinctness property means that you're only going to uh, uh, the the, le the length the communication complexity is only going to scale with uh, essentially the length of a signature, uh, which is uh, just going to be a polynomial in the security parameter. Now, in order to get anonymity, we use our witness indistinguishability transformation on top of what I described so far. And this is going to give us anonymity. It's going to give us witness indistinguishability for this uh, uh, delegation scheme, which actually means that uh, the, the verifier cannot tell which witness was used in order to uh, prove the validity of the statement, which actually means that it cannot tell which attributes the user, the user actually owns. It only knows that these are, they own some attributes that satisfy the relation. And this concludes the construction. And this also concludes my talk. Thank you very much.